HBR presents. According to Smithsonian Magazine, Dan Cohn, founder of NetMarket, conducted the first end-to-end online sales transaction when he sold his CD of Sting's Ten Summoner's Tales to a friend in Philadelphia for $12.48 in 1994. It was an inauspicious beginning to what has become a $1.7 trillion global industry. According to Retailer.com, 50% of e-commerce sales were made through online marketplaces in 2019, a number that is expected to grow rapidly in the coming decade. Digital natives could be forgiven for assuming that it's always been this way, but of course, like every other disruption in business, the evolution of e-commerce has involved fierce competition and strategic gamesmanship between global players on a rapidly changing landscape. And to the victor, go the spoils. Today on Cold Call, we welcome Professor Felix Oberholzer-G to discuss his case entitled Alibaba's Taobao. I'm your host, Brian Kenny, and you're listening to Cold Call on the HBR Presents Network. Felix Oberhoser G is an expert on competitive strategy and international competition. He is the author of the newly published book, Better Simpler Strategy, a value-based guide to exceptional performance. And he's also a podcaster. He's the co-host of a fabulous podcast called After Hours, along with other HBS faculty, Young Me Moon, Mahir Desai, and various guests that are popping in and out. It's one of my favorite shows. Felix, I'm thrilled to have you on Cold Call today. Thanks for joining me. It's great to be here. Thank you, Brian. What I really want to do is use this case that we're going to talk about today as a way to hear about some of the ideas in your new book. I know that the case is a good stepping off point for that. The book is about strategy, and that's something that you think deeply about and that you teach about here at the school. So I think people will will really enjoy listening to the story about Taobao, which is part of Alibaba. Let's just dig in. Tell me, what would your cold call be to start this case in the classroom? Like many faculty members, I have a few go-to cases that I just love teaching. I must have taught the Taobao case dozens of times. And if I could teach it tomorrow, I definitely would. It's a case about an underdog in an industry landscape that is typically dominated by big platforms. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, we're thinking of Taobao as China's equivalent of perhaps Amazon today. But at the time of the case in the early 2000s, eBay, interestingly, was dominant in China. Mm -hmm. And it was just like it's almost unthinkable how you might compete against Amazon in the United States. It was almost unthinkable how you might compete against eBay in China at that particular time. And then, of course, Alibaba did it. And Taobao is now the top dog, faces new competition, interestingly, also in China today. But it's the story of being the small player, the small company in a market that is dominated by a big platform. The case develops an idea that is featured prominently in the book also, what I often refer to as strategies for underdogs. Mm -hmm. What can you do that the big player cannot easily imitate. This case takes place in the mid-2000s into the early 2010 timeframe. How does it relate to the questions that you try to answer as a scholar? And importantly, how does it surface in the book that you've just published? So the big question is really how you compete as a smaller player against a big platform. This is a theme that I explore at length in the book. The big platforms, they all benefit from what we call network effects. Mm -hmm. Network effects are a mechanism that renders a platform or a business or a product more valuable if more people use it. So imagine you're the only person on Facebook. Well, it's not such a great experience. Uh, The more people join, the more valuable it becomes. The question then is, if the big platform is so far ahead, what can you do to catch up? And the Taobao versus eBay story set in China explores the possibilities. Taobao uses really two things, I think, that I see in lots of other markets and that I describe in the book also about how smaller platforms can compete. The first idea is really the big network benefits from an increased willingness to pay. Willingness to pay, one of the key strategic variables in thinking about competitive strategy, is the most a customer would ever pay for a product or a service. Mm -hmm. If my company benefits from network effects, that's elevated irrespective of the quality of the service or the attractiveness of the platform to begin with. 
And so the smaller player needs to think about how can I increase my customers, my clients' willingness to pay without having the benefit of scale. So for instance, if you have an idea that involves significant fixed cost, that's probably not a leading candidate to compete against the big platform because the big platform can spread fixed costs much more easily than you can. And so not surprisingly, what we see Alibaba do is implement a whole range of ideas that are essentially low cost or variable cost so that the big platform, if it decides to imitate, doesn't have a natural advantage in this imitation process. So for people who aren't familiar with Alibaba, maybe you can describe them before we dive into those details. What is Alibaba? And a little bit about Jack Ma, too, the founder. He's a colorful character. (laughs) <laughs> yes, certainly. He's a teacher originally, and then the first really big business that he built is Alibaba, the name of the group today. And Alibaba is really a B2B business, so it allowed many smaller and medium-sized Chinese companies to start selling online. Start selling online domestically, that was important, but I think even more important is selling internationally. Because it wasn't easy for Chinese businesses at that point in time to reach their overseas customers. Mm -hmm. When you think about just how dramatically important exports are for the Chinese economy, in part, this was facilitated in a really big way by Alibaba. eBay and Alibaba didn't really touch one another for quite some time because eBay, just like in the U.S., was mostly a consumer-oriented site, and Alibaba competed in this B2B space. Mm -hmm. And then in the Chinese context, eBay had a really quick increase in what they call power sellers. So power sellers are people who are essentially middlemen. They look a little bit like individual customers and they look a little bit like an actual B2B business with B2B transactions. And so naturally, Jack Ma was very concerned about eBay encroaching on Alibaba's turf. Mm -hmm. So that triggered the response that during the SARS epidemic, he decided, and we're going to build a business called Taobao, which means hunting for treasures, that is squarely in the C2C space. The team that developed the business was locked up in Jack Ma's apartment in Shanghai. They couldn't go outside, just like during COVID, we can't go outside because SARS was potentially even more fatal than uh, COVID-19 today. And so they used that period of time when they had engineering resources that couldn't really go anywhere. They used that period of time to build a competitor. eBay had 85% market share at the time. So how on earth would you ever compete? The case essentially allows students to see what kinds of variable cost ideas that a company might have in order to increase its customers' willingness to pay. And the discovery is that it's sort of a different design. It's a whole suite of features that are interestingly not really directed at eBay's customers in the first place. This is early days of the internet. It seemed mildly crazy to buy something online, and many people waited on the sidelines. In the book, these groups of people I call near customers. They're almost in the market, but not quite. Their willingness to pay is just slightly shy of the price that you would have to pay. It has to do with lots of concerns. You know, I'm giving someone my financial information. Maybe you're going to send me the packet that I ordered. Maybe you're not going to send me the product. Maybe the product will be broken. And so you see Taobao develop a whole range of features that essentially build trust among near customers. And that has two effects. One is You're not really fighting for the same group of customers that eBay already owns. That's much easier to do than luring customers from a big platform that benefits from network effects. And it solves a major issue in the development of e-commerce. In fact, that market, the market that Taobao targeted, ended up being so much more important than eBay's market. And eBay, eventually, you might remember, they left China. So let's talk a little bit about Meg Whitman and the way that she was sizing this whole thing up. You know, eBay at this time already had expanded into the European market. They were obviously you know, founded in the U.S., so they had sort of cornered that space. How were they thinking about the China market? What did they think the opportunity was there? So they were extremely 
optimistic about the prospects of eBay in the China market. They made a minority investment first in a business that was built by two HBS graduates who started Taobao, and then eventually they took over the company. And if you look at the China market, everything looks perfect. Right? It looks like we have deep local knowledge because we have these two local founders who really understand the local market. Uh, we have 85% market share, which is decisive if you think about competition between different platforms. In public statements, Meg Whitman is just very optimistic. China is eBay's to lose. And there isn't really competition inside. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the really interesting dynamics that we end up talking in the class is if the entrant goes after near customers, that's not something you easily see in your own data. And you don't realize that someone else is catching up on you because the someone else is actually not exactly catering to the people you serve to begin with. Mm -hmm. By the time you notice that someone else, Taobao, is actually so big that now the network effects tip what used to be this wonderful protection that eBay had in that they had the biggest network effects now turns against them because they're relatively small and Taobao has a greater customer size, has greater network effects. So there's really two ideas that are at the center of the case. First is the idea that if I compete against someone with network effects, I need to find alternative ways to build willingness to pay over time. And I need to do it in a cheap variable cost manner. Mm -hmm. And the second idea is if I go after near customers, that's actually much more promising, much easier to do. And in particular, you know, it's not so concerning for my rival because you don't actually see in your data what is happening, possibly until it's too late. How important is local knowledge to this case? So in other words, Taobao, obviously, they're, they're from China. They understand the Chinese culture. They understand the, the buying habits of Chinese people. The case alludes to eBay going into Japan and having a rough go of it. And I'm wondering, what do they take away from that? Did they do anything differently when they went into China, or should they have? It's a beautiful example of strategic learning. I usually start the class by asking everyone, what happened in Japan? <laughs> you know, eBay globally, so many markets, so successful, and then all of a sudden you strike out in Japan. And that discussion sort of builds two insights. The first one is this network effects story so that everybody knows about the importance of network effects for these platforms. And the second insight is really the insight around just how important local knowledge is. So for instance, eBay was completely used to using credit cards. Uh, Japanese customers cash on demand. The eBay model is essentially, you know, sort of used products kind of model in the United States. Everything that's been sitting in your garage for a long time and <laughs> you haven't had a chance to think about it, that's a prospect for a sale on eBay. And in Japan, people were interested in new products. No one was interested in sort of the secondhand or rarity products. There is a particular amount of local knowledge that you need in order to be successful. And what's really beautiful about eBay's strategy is, so they lose Japan, and then when you see what they do in China, they buy a local business started by our alums uh, that has 85% market share. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, gives you this amazing confidence that there's really nothing that can go wrong, because now you have both of these things. You have network effects, and then you have local knowledge, and you should be just okay until you're not, because you have a rival that competes in very smart ways. So there were some pivotal decisions that the Taobao team made early on as they were moving down this path and they sort of set their sights on eBay. Can you describe what some of those important strategic calls that they made early on were and how they impacted the trajectory of Taobao? One major decision was to organize the Tao website in the exact same manner that Chinese department stores are organized. And the reason why this is important is, remember, we're trying to cater to these near customers that are nervous about buying online. So if I go online and I look at the website, and know, oh my God, I sort of know how things are arranged here. This is exactly what a Chinese department store looks like. That's, of course, a big advantage. And then really one of the most important things that they did was the creation of Alipay. Alipay is essentially an escrow service. The seller of a product is not being paid until the recipient acknowledges that he or she has received the product. 
in a low trust environment where the internet was relatively novel, that played an enormous role. In the book, I call this a compliment. So a compliment is a product or a service that increases willingness to pay for something else. But that was really a, a key decision that every company that has compliments needs to very carefully think about. Do you provide these compliments just for your own product? And then that means you have a leg up mm -hmm. in the market relative to the competition. Or do you provide it for the entire market? In which case, you help the market as a whole grow. So let me give you an example. Tesla superchargers. You have a choice. You could make these chargers so that they only charge Tesla cars. In which case, Tesla has an advantage against all the other producers of electric vehicles. Uh -huh. Or you could decide, no, actually, the big problem with electric vehicles is that we don't have enough charging stations, period. And so you make it available to everyone, and that really fuels the market as a whole. It does away with that relative advantage, but it fuels the market as a whole. And in the case of Alipay, very smartly, and after a hot internal debate, Alibaba decided to make Alipay available to everyone. And then from there, it grew its financial services business, which is probably now as valuable as the remaining e-commerce businesses that they've built over time. And that's amazing. It, well, it also makes me think of PayPal, which I think started as an eBay service and is now being used across all these other platforms. Is that a, a fair comparison? That's right. So when eBay purchases PayPal, the idea is exactly this idea of a compliment. That's something that is an interesting decision to make. Do you want the compliment to be in-house or do you want the compliment to be provided by someone who's a different entity, possibly by lots of different entities? Mm -hmm. Think of Apple. Used to be you know, all the profits came from the hardware side. Now, all of a sudden, we see such dramatic increase in the profits that come from the software side. That's the power of compliment. You get to shift profit pools back and forth essentially responding to competitive pressures. As long as you're way ahead in hardware, you make all your money in hardware. Yeah. When that's a little less obvious, you start making money on services. And you see the same within Amazon. You see the same within Alibaba Group. This is now literally dozens of companies with dozens of opportunities to shift profit pools among these companies in really interesting ways. So that's a, maybe the third big lesson other than network effects near customers is just the importance of these compliments to make your company grow and to put your company in a favorable competitive position in the market. Those are great examples. And I'm wondering, in the book, you must provide some other examples of companies that have faced sort of similar scenarios as Taobao was facing, these sort of underdog firms. Are there any that you can share with us? We still want people to buy the book, by the way. So, <laughs> so there's a really interesting example that involves Facebook. Facebook obviously you know, building a small business first, right? Which is a little counterintuitive. Oh, social networks have these network effects. Why on earth would you restrict who can be on Facebook to begin with? In the beginning, it's literally only Harvard, then it's the Ivy League universities, and then they grow very slowly. The intuition here is that if you target a particular subset of the market, where people highly, highly value being connected to one another, that can be as powerful, can be as successful as sort of being, you know, an average platform where you meet lots and lots of other average people. You value connections, but there's nothing particularly special. And you see this in social networks, you see this in dating platforms. We have interesting differentiation strategies depending on to what extent you cater to a niche and to what extent you build sort of one platform serves all kinds of businesses that then benefit from network effects. But the network effects are not super, super strong because I don't highly value being connected to people in Norway because I don't know anyone in Norway, mm. as opposed to, oh, the platform is relatively small, but I value everyone else who happens to be on this platform. And so it's a counterintuitive way of building platforms where the fact that you're small, the fact that you're niche, actually ends up being an advantage, at least in the early days of building the business. Yeah. 
We've had several episodes of Cold Call where we've talked about platform companies. It's an increasingly important aspect of the of the landscape these days in business are these marketplaces. Is it easier now for an underdog to penetrate the big players in the space because of the internet and the asset light nature of businesses that are marketplaces? Could you have done this with some of the more mature industries that are more asset based? So we used to be super optimistic that essentially any platform business would be winner take all. The entire Silicon Valley enthusiasm for no profits but lots of growth rested on in in good part on this notion that eventually you be completely dominant because these are all winner take all markets. Now you see time after time after time. Well, winner take most but probably not winner take all. And so the question is what is it about the platforms that you know gives them significant power but makes them not be a clear winner that would then allow you to raise prices and create really great returns for the original investors. And there are a few things. Geography is one, right? If you're Uber, you have to fight for every market individually. Mm -hmm. If you have lots of drivers in San Francisco, that doesn't really help us in Boston because we're not in San Francisco. There is the interesting differentiation place that we just talked about in the context of Taobao and the Facebook story. And then there's also something that I often describe as the implicit orientation of a platform. The best example that I can think of is competition between Amazon and Etsy. Etsy, the handmade, hand curated platform, mm -hmm. when Amazon enters their space by creating Amazon handmade, people are super pessimistic about the likelihood that Etsy can survive. Why? Well, all the network effects are on Amazon's side. And now, of course, we know, oh my God, Etsy has done, has done so incredibly well. What's different about the two? Well, Amazon in the end is always in the customer's corner. You know, every contentious decision, every big decision that they make is really with amazing focus on customers. Mm -hmm. Etsy, much more focused on makers, much more focused on the producers on the platform. In many ways, they're, they're close substitutes, but it's just enough differentiation that actually there's room for both companies in, in the marketplace. And so I have a chapter in the book that is called Strategies for Underdogs, which, which essentially talks about all of these different ways that smaller platforms can survive. The upshot is, of course, that investors' expectations that may have been led by, in a few years, this platform will be globally dominant or will be dominant at least in the North American or in the Chinese market, those expectations are often disappointed now because people have become really smart and they're building small, powerful businesses mm. that then limit the opportunities for the really large platforms. Yeah. Uh, this has been a super interesting conversation. I, I've got a couple more questions before we let you go. I want to go back to the Taobao case for a minute because one of the central questions in the case has to do with the revenue model of which Jack Ma is quoted in the case, I think, as saying, we don't have a revenue model. I know there's a B case about this. Can you talk a little bit about what they attempted to do and what the reaction was by the customer base? So as often as a small platform, your fees, your price is zero, right? Because otherwise you don't stand a chance to begin with. And then once eBay leaves, of course, there's the question, how are you going to make money? That question is pretty important because at that point in time, Alibaba is a publicly traded company in Hong Kong and Taobao is privately owned in China. And so you're writing a check to a private entity which is never the easiest thing to do and easily raises a shareholder suspicions about what's going on. So their first idea is to auction off spots on the website, mm. a little similar to the classic Google model with one twist that if people click but they don't buy, then you don't have to pay the fee. So it's a classic auction, but you don't own Taobao anything unless you actually get a benefit as the seller, which was an interesting model to think about. When they introduced it, as always on the internet, once you raise prices, you know, there was enormous backlash. Uh, but what was interesting about the response was that about 40% of the market or so, they actually liked that kind of a model. When they dug a little deeper and looked at the motivations for people to favor or disfavor 
this new monetization scheme, they saw that there's a substantial portion of the market that believes, maybe rightly so, maybe maybe not, we don't actually know, that the companies that bid high on these auctions, they have higher prices and they have higher quality products. Taobao seized on the data, seized on this insight and created what's now called the mall, the T-mall, which is essentially Taobao at higher prices with better quality and then an easy monetization model that essentially monetizes the sellers on the market side. And that then was like a really, financially speaking, the big breakthrough that made the company really successful and really valuable. It was smart interpretation of the data that they got back that then helped them figure out, you know, what's a really promising monetization model given the peculiar circumstances in the Chinese market at that point in time. Just bolsters the argument that we continue to hear about data analytics and how important they are, how important it is to understand the numbers that you're looking at and how they inform decisions that you can make. That's right. And asking your customers about important strategic decisions, which is not that common, right? So we we typically think A-B testing some small element on the website. Yes, of course, we'll easily follow customers. But making big decisions about how do you monetize, what does your strategy look like, it's much less common to really directly take customer feedback the way Taobao had done this, but which turned out to be, in this particular case, really successful. Felix, we have time for one more question with you. And and what I'd like to know is, as people hear you talk about this case, what's one thing you'd like people to take away from the case? What's the big lesson here? There's all the tools, obviously. There's uh, understanding willingness to pay, understanding network effects, understanding near customers. But there's also an interesting moment in the case conversation Students essentially make the argument that eBay loses the Chinese market because they don't understand the Chinese customer. And Taobao is more local. They have all the insights, and it's not surprising that they win. And then we look a little more closely in the case, and we see an early landing page for Taobao. And the landing page looks nothing like a landing page in China needs to look at to be appealing to customers. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that we talk about in the class is that you often have these insights that you think, yes, the local company knows better, or the foreign company is at a disadvantage because it's not quite as close to customers or because it has to coordinate activities with headquarters in San Francisco. And then before you know it, once you have a strong prior, you just exclude all the information that is inconsistent with what you believe. And that's a really nice experiential moment. Of course, we all know confirmation bias is prevalent. And, you know, you can give a lecture on confirmation bias and students will nod. And it's not going to change anything, I, I don't think. Sometimes it's interesting, even once some students see that they suffer from confirmation bias and they interpret the data correctly, many others will not follow. The confirmation bias in this case is so strong that even in the face of being taught what the data tell you, it's not so easy for you to see how you were biased by the priors that you had to begin with. And that's definitely one of the things that sometimes students talk about later on when, you know, many years after graduation, when they, when they write back and they give me examples about their experiences in the business world, that's a moment that many people will refer to because I guess it's really close to home. Yeah. Very interesting. And I'm sure any listener out there who is thinking about starting up their own marketplace or platform now has some great insights for what to look at. And the book, again, is called Better Simpler Strategy, A Value-Based Guide to Exceptional Performance. I'm assuming you can find it on all the platforms that you shop on. Yes. (laughs) Felix, thank you so much for joining us today. I really enjoyed it. It was my pleasure to be here. Thank you. If you enjoy Cold Call, you should check out our other podcasts from Harvard Business School, including After Hours, Skydeck, and Managing the Future of Work. Find them on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. Thanks again for joining us. I'm your host, Brian Kenny, and you've been listening to Cold Call, an official podcast of Harvard Business School brought to you by the HBR Presents Network.